Welcome to Lecture 6B. This is Human Resources Management. I'm Tom Stevenson. And uh, today we're going to be looking at employment, society, and the law in this course, and internal labor markets. We're going to just be going through some general concepts in these particular areas so that you have a better understanding what managers have to actually deal with from a human resources management perspective. Uh, employment, society, and the law, uh, we have to think about as a business that we have to comply with uh, certain regulatory requirements and that government, for a variety of reasons, often intrudes into the relationship between employer and employee. Kind of goes back to what we were talking about with uh, industrial relations and unionization. You know, uh, if things are just left laissez-faire, then you often will get into situations where uh, employers may take advantage of their employees. So that's why there are certain labor laws that are in place to protect employees from their employers. And unions have played a very large role historically in getting a lot of this legislation passed. Because when unions push against employers historically, they raise the standards and as we mentioned in the last lecture you know a high tide floats all boats so that's usually had spin-off effects for example if you're talking about safety on the job site when unions have uh, petitioned and negotiated better standards uh, often those standards then become the threshold for where government regulation comes into place so go government often intrudes into that relationship to protect employees uh, so yeah, you as a manager, it's important to know what are the requirements? What legislation do you have to comply with so that you're not doing something that goes against the legislation and later find yourself in trouble, either fine-wise or criminal-wise too. Some of the safety standards can even bring criminal charges against uh, managers and against corporations for uh, not complying with them or purposely not complying with them or knowingly not complying with them. So uh, some of the more normal basis or normative basis for government intervention uh, regards uh, the best interest to, to protect employees because sometimes employees don't know what their best interests are. In the case of construction work, often you have people working piecework. Piecework means you're working based on how much work you do. Well, you know what? When you get paid by doing more work, often you'll want to cut corners with regards to personal safety. So that might mean going on a roof without a fall arrest system. Uh, that might mean working with guards not in place in certain equipment. And when you cut corners, then there's accidents. And of course, accidents are devastating for the employee. Uh, they're not great for the company either. It really kind of wrecks the morale of the company. We talked about culture. You know, if I'm an employee and I feel my employer doesn't have my best interests at heart, I probably don't have my best intentions towards that employer. So it's a two-way street. But government also wants to protect employees against what they may not knowingly know or fully understand or protect them against themselves as well as their employers. Uh, so... Uh, we have in Ontario what we call the Ministry of Labour, and the Ministry of Labour enforces the Occupational Health and Safety Act, in the, for example, for construction projects, uh, mining, transportation, other areas, because the employee may not know otherwise. They may not know what they should or should not be doing. And so Ministry of Labour has inspectors that will randomly show up on job sites uh, to ensure that they are working to... Uh, comply with the standards. The Ministry of Labor is kind of like the enforcement arm of government to make sure that people are doing what they should be doing. They also in inspect accidents and give out fines if people are not complying with that part of the legislation. So uh, that is uh, going back to the, the labor laws. Uh, that's where you get a lot of the, the labor laws and other things coming out to make sure that, you know, you could have parents that for some reason or another are desperate and they have their kids missing school to actually work on some sort of project. Well, they have no choice when there's legislation in place. and No company is going to want to um, invite that kind of problem, not when 
that is the legislation it's strictly enforced anybody could call in to have it enforced uh, it just would not make sense going back in the 1800s not a problem now big problem so uh, sometimes too as i mentioned people may act on foolishness uh, we want to get this job done we want to do something or not thinking employees can get direct fines for doing something that they shouldn't be doing working on a construction site without a hard hat those employees would get a fine and their manager would get a larger fine and the business would get a still larger fine i don't know if they've changed it recently but businesses used to be able to get up to five hundred thousand dollar fines it may have gone up uh, since then and there is if you're a business and if you're uh, an owner of a business you could be actually get in criminal charges up to six months in jail and as a direct supervisor you could be received twenty five thousand dollars in fines and employees can also receive direct fines so there is a lot of uh, purpose and clout and teeth in the legislation if you will so externalities uh, condition to protect a third party uh, you know there's also uh, the aspect of a uh, person may be willing to take risks uh, on the job for extra pay but if safety guidelines are not followed then the accident is likely uh, an example of government protection for employees uh, it's broken down into three areas i mentioned the ministry of labor uh, there's also the workers safety insurance board and infrastructure health and and safety association uh, of ontario so i h s a so there are kind of three areas one the workers safety and insurance board is uh, like an insurance for workers so if you become hurt on the job uh, you will receive compensation uh, what the compensation is depends how you were hurt how long you're going to be off the job uh, etc and this is mandatory no employer can avoid it in Ontario they have to pay into it as well so they pay a certain percentage of the employees wages into the workers safety and insurance board so that that worker is protected they have a, a, a duty to to collect that money and they have a duty to uh, pay out that money uh, as required and they rate employers much like insurance companies do car insurance so if you're an employer and you've had a lot of accidents you're going to pay a much higher premium the premium could be high enough that it actually makes it hard to do business so you want to make sure that you're minimizing there's an incentive there an extrinsic in ex uh, incentive to ensure that uh, you're protecting your employees because it's not good for business to be paying a high high rate we can talk about the cultural side as well you know there's a lot of accidents like i mentioned a, a minute ago uh, employees don't feel that your company cares about them if they don't if you feel your company or your boss doesn't care about you why should you care about the company or your boss so you want to have a mutually positive kind of relationship going on there uh, so Worker Safety Insurance Board, that's their requirement. And should your employer not pay their, pay their dues, well, that's going to be their problem in getting fines because you would still be covered. It's not your, your responsibility. Oh, did they pay last week's premium? Did they, am I covered, so, so to speak? It's a mandatory requirement by the government. Uh, Ministry of Labor, as we said, they enforce it. So they enforce the Occupational Health and Safety Act. They make sure that you're employer is complying with it they give out fines when they're not so they're kind of like the police side of it and then infrastructure infrastructure health and safety association they're kind of like on the preventative side they're kind of like we don't want this to happen so we offer training uh, certifications and safety to make sure that employees are up to speed like uh, workplace health and information systems WIMIS uh, that is mandatory in Ontario that's one of the programs that they uh, ensure gets delivered and they offer help in give uh, companies delivering that information fall arrest systems uh, all of these kinds of safety programs that they have numerous numerous 
safety pro programs, trying to prevent accidents from occurring. So one's prevention, uh, one's kind of on the back end, the worker safety and insurance board, and one's kind of in the enforcement area in the middle. So that's kind of how that works. Uh, so that's WSIB and Worker Safety and Insurance Board and Infrastructure Health and Safety. So the other part is protecting the inalienable rights of the individual. Uh, they have a right to safe, a privacy, a right to safety, and a right to quit. So the individual should not be able to transfer these rights. It's not like your employer should say, no, I want you to tell me all about your health background. I want to know all these particular things. Uh, no, I want you to go up on this roof. I don't care if you think it's dangerous. You have to go up on to this roof. You have a right to refusal uh, according to the Occupational Health and Safety Act, which means you can refuse work uh, without the expectation of punitive uh, damage uh, if you feel your employer is not following the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And you always have the right to quit, right? So uh, these are things that you can't transfer or you should not be able to transfer uh, in uh, our uh, environment. Again, probably actually the one that's under the most fire, I would say, uh, rec you know, over the last 10 years is right to privacy. The way things are with the internet and the way information travels, that's the one that is the most uh, troublesome and that's the one that's been eroding in a lot of ways. But it is definitely enshrined from employer-employee relationships. However, you as an employee, if you're posting all kinds of information up on the internet and it's accessible, that's becoming much more uh, difficult from that uh, perspective. So. Management might want uh, government intervention. It can be good because, you know, if you're, if you're a company and you are really care about your employees and you have uh, safety requirements, but it, all these safety requirements have costs associated with it, uh, if the government legislates higher levels of safety regulation, then that means that your uh, competition has to comply. So that can be good for you. That can be uh, positive in that sense that now they have to comply as well so you don't have to uh, spend they have to spend the same kind of amount of money on it and you're you're equalized you're, you're more competitive that way uh, sometimes they may want uh, it also that it, they can be sort of a standing out from their competition and that can make them look good and they can win awards and they can win sort of uh, make brand themselves as a leader in that particular uh, area uh, also, if government legislates things, it makes it easier that they are doing things that later employees might want to uh, seek some sort of compensation from, from them not having known better. Uh, so these are all areas that can be helpful for companies uh, in that perspective. Uh, general management points, you know, you have to know what the constraints are. You have to know what the legislation is for your particular area. So it's, it's fruitful to really get a, a grasp of that. And supervisors should understand any of the legal act implications for their actions or non-actions. Sometimes not doing something is just as bad as doing something. And really be in vigilant in times where differences uh, in communication uh, may be more prevalent where, and where employees might be more vocal about a violation. You know, there's always these gray areas too within the legislation. Uh, I've often uh, asked questions to Ministry of Labor regarding guidelines on, say, fall arrest systems on a roof. Well, somebody has to go on the roof to put the fall arrest system there in the first place. So them actually putting that system could mean they're vulnerable while putting it in place. And if they have an accident, is that going to be negative towards me? What are the repercussions of that? So there's it's trying to really come to grips with understanding that. And you, sometimes you have to push the envelope, really understanding where the gray area is and what's, what's explainable, what you can justify and what you can't. Uh, sometimes if you look at all the regulatory requirements out there as a business, uh, you could be so humbled by them that you might not do certain things. So sometimes it's coming to a better understanding and sometimes you have to work through things to come to that better understanding to ensure that you're complying properly and at the same time running a successful business. So you don't want to do anything unethical. You don't want to do anything unsafe that's going to put your employees at risk. Uh, but sometimes you have to uh, find out exactly what 
is acceptable? What, how does the Ministry of Labor interpret this legislation so you can make sure that you comply? Because when you read it, it doesn't seem like it's possible for you to fully comply with it. But when you consult with them and ensure that you are in, in uh, compliance, uh, then you're going to feel much more better about uh, doing whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. The second area that I wanted to discuss in this lecture is internal labor market. Sometimes it's referred to as an ILM. An ILM is where a company consciously attempts to have a ladder within the organization that people can move up. So if you're hired in an organization at a very junior position, you can likely see people throughout the organization that were in that position before and they've moved up the ladder, so to speak. Uh, internal labor markets do a lot of things. Uh, they uh, help motivate people that want to do better for themselves, that see themselves growing in an organization, which helps to create loyalty with employees, provide opportunities, and then if they're really on the ball, they even provide training opportunities, help to fund training, taking extra courses, etc., so that they develop the skills necessary to move into those positions. It is very helpful because uh, you learn on the job, you understand the company, all those things that we've talked about in previous lectures where you've got relationships and networks, uh, you maintain those. Conversely, if a company does not do that, then uh, people leave, especially who leaves. Who do you think would leave in an organization like that? People that would leave would be the best people, the people that are really motivated to better themselves, people with a growth mindset. So an internal labor market is a pretty smart thing to do within an organization. Uh, you know, in some organizations, even unionized organizations can be broken up that people have opportunities. Sometimes it's mandated by the union that, you know, if uh, it's a union member, before you can hire outside, you have to hire within the organization. That can be really encouraging for people within the organization. So uh, even a college uh, professor example where you have uh, partial load and part-time and sessional, so there's very defined categories, full-time work. Um, there's opportunities uh, within th those uh, memberships, and then there's opportunities then to apply for a full-time position. So for example, if you're in a partial load position and a full-time position becomes available, you would have the first rights to apply to that position, and somebody else would have to uh, have better qualifications, much better qualifications than you, and they won't even look at outside qualifications. It's only within the, within the college first, and then they would post it outside the college. So uh, some people would see working uh, a partial load hours as an opportunity to feed into the full time. So that might mean you get some very good people that you might not otherwise attract early on. And then you can also have a kind of a track record to see how uh, good they were at their jobs. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, opportunities there. There's a lot of uh, benefits uh, to an internal labor market. Now, one of the things with an internal labor market uh, is when you hire within, of course, the other problem that creates is if somebody moves up to a new position, then somebody has to replace their position. And if it's from within, then somebody has to replace their position. So it kind of creates a hiring process that has to go on, which might be more obviously labor intensive. It could even be more disruptive. Uh, so that can be uh, problematic in some cases. Uh, the other thing that also occur encourages um, uh, only hiring from within, you're only hiring people with exactly sort of the same cultural mindset. And sometimes that limits fresh ideas from outside. You know, you might have people that come in with some fresh ideas of how another company was doing things that, that your company never thought of. So they might have some new insight to bring to the company. So only hiring within sometimes can have some limitations that way. Conversely, as I said already, uh, you, are, you have a lot of skills and you know the company and you're moving up into a position that maybe you already have a good idea how 
it's being done and you kind of know a lot of the limitations. Sure, there's new things to learn and do, uh, but it's not totally foreign to you. So there's a lot of advantages to hiring within. There's some disadvantages. Usually I find that there's enough people that get hired from outside because there isn't enough people qualified inside that those are kind of mitigated, the aspect of not having fresh insight. But yeah, surely if you only hired from within, that could have some limitations uh, that way. And they've even seen it in the automotive sector where you you know some of the CEOs really grew up from within the company, like a Ford Motor Company or that sort of thing. Uh, but in more recent years, there's been a little bit more uh, hiring from outside. Uh, where they brought even it in as a CEO, somebody that is was in a different uh, sector instead of the auto sector. And that's been interesting as well. And there's been some successes there as well. I think Ford Motor Company had a pretty good success with Malay Mahali. I probably pronounced it wrong. But uh, so you have to look at that. You have to determine those things. But historically, it's been to a company's advantage to have those internal labor markets. It's much more engaging and much more motivating for people if they see, feel they have opportunities within this business to grow as they desire. And those that don't want to grow, well, they can stay in those positions that they enjoy or that's as far as they really want to go with things. So internal labor markets help that way and really sort of f firm up uh, the employee uh, loyalty uh, aspects. Uh, you, you know, un unhappy employees may only uh, get more cynical as time goes on so if we can build loyalty that's important and efforts therefore taken to make them more happy motivated within the confines of the strategic plan uh, and business constraints can only be a positive aspect and internal labor market uh, does that uh, there's also a reliance typically on seniority rights in most internal labor markets. So if you've got two people applying and one is more senior, unless the other person can really has a lot more qualifications, uh, the senior person would likely get it. Uh, in a union environment, it's really driven by sen seniority. Like there would have to be some tantamount that that senior person doesn't have the qualifications to do this particular job for them not to be able to get the job. Uh, but in a non-unionized sector, it, you know, there's a little bit more latitude uh, from that perspective. And there's a process in place if somebody's not satisfied with how the hiring process went. So uh, before we meet synchronously, it would be helpful if you look through some of these questions and thought about them, and we can discuss them when we meet synchronously and uh, discuss them in more detail. And I'll have a bunch of other things that we'll discuss in our uh, live uh, classes. So I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you very, very, very soon online. Bye for now.